We are at the edge of a spiral galaxy, far from the galactic core. This small planet is our Earth, its pole crowned with the circle of northern lights, the whole planet glowing in the infrared warmth of a star we rarely think about, a star we call Sun. It is almost midwinter in Ireland. Soon the sun will begin its journey back from the south. Waiting for the sun is a Stone Age building, older than the pyramids of Egypt. Above the entrance is a mysterious skylight, built by people who understood very well the ways of the sun. Sunrise on the shortest day of the year, the winter solstice. On that day, the first rays of the sunrise spear through the skylight and down a perfectly aligned passageway to penetrate to the room at the core of the structure, to mark almost magically, but with great precision, the beginning of a new year. This is the oldest room on Earth. Its careful alignment, perhaps the oldest evidence of scientific thought ever found. Our sun is a star, one of billions. It has shone for five billion years and will shine for five billion more. For us, it is the great engine of life. If you're near the pole, the summer days never end. The sun shines through midnight and new days are born out of days that never ended. There you can almost feel the earth rolling around beneath the sky. Most ancient civilizations recognized the sun as the source of all life and called it God. They observed it with care, sometimes setting up stone markers to send that knowledge through time. The one sure prediction in an unpredictable world, the sun sets, but the sun also rises. Any break in that pattern once caused terror and foreboding.
the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon. But the moon is 400 times closer. So on those rare occasions when the moon passes exactly between us and the sun, the disk of the moon exactly covers the disk of the sun. Masked by the moon, the sun reveals its mysterious corona. The eerie streamers of light heightened the mystery and increased the power of those who could predict these awesome events. the eclipse records kept by the astronomer priests of ancient Babylon. They are so accurate that scientists today use them to correct computer programs. The Sun Gate at Tiwanaku in Bolivia. a fragment of a sun cult dating back more than a thousand years. Nearby, high in the Andes, is Lake Titicaca. And in the center of the lake, the island of the sun. On this island, this rocky hill was once plated in Inca gold. Here, the sun god anointed the first Inca and sent him north through the Andes to create an empire that grew to be as big as Europe, with many dazzling cities, among them the lost city of Machu Picchu. Like the people of ancient Ireland, the farmers of the Inca Empire needed an accurate calendar. If they planted their terraces too soon, the corn would freeze in the ground, too late, and it would never ripen. There is one building at Machu Picchu that is like no other, the Torreon. Its curved wall is pierced by an opening that is so aligned that it will project the first rays of the midwinter sunrise precisely to the edge of a carved rock, and so mark the first day of the Inca year. The highest outcrop at Machu Picchu is called the Hitching Post of the Sun. From it, the Incas imagined a great leash stretching out to hold on to the sun as it paced the horizon like a restless llama. The ancient Greeks imagined the sun as a god who drove his chariot across the sky. But they abandoned their myths for a more rational cosmos nearly two and a half thousand years ago. Aristotle taught that the world was round and theorized that the sun and planets must be carried through space embedded in crystal spheres that were nested around the earth like Russian dolls. He assumed that the earth was at the center of the universe, misleading astronomers for centuries. By then the all-powerful church had placed God in Aristotle's seventh heaven. cathedral at Frombok on the shore of the Baltic Sea. At about the time Columbus sailed for America, a young astronomer struggled here with the contradictions of Aristotle as he observed the tracks of the planets across the sky. To Nicholas Copernicus, it made no sense until he made one of the great intellectual leaps of all time. The 
The sun was the center of a system, the Earth merely one of its planets. It was a cosmos awesome enough for one of humanity's great minds, Galileo Galilei. Galileo was the first person to point a telescope at the stars. He saw that Copernicus was right. Galileo found that the sun was not the flawless orb required by dogma. It was as spotty as a teenager. The sun was at the center. But the church had no intention of vacating center stage. Galileo was put on trial before the Inquisition, a court that had the power to burn him at the stake, to inflict any torture. They showed him their instruments, and the threat was enough. The most respected scientist of his day signed a confession that he knew was nonsense. Dogma had triumphed. The cathedrals of the new age were the cathedrals of science. And new instruments were built, not for torture, but to find new galaxies. To peer into the heart of the sun. At first, researchers could see only the bland white face that is revealed by visible light, and sometimes the procession of mysterious dark spots that some took to be clouds. The Earth's atmosphere clouded and distorted the image. But in time, the great solar telescopes like Big Bear in California blew away the notion of a placid, unchanging sun. People wondered what the sun was made of, but never expected to know it's 93 million miles away. The answer was discovered in the colors of the sunlight itself. As each element burns, it consumes its own distinctive color, writes its own signature in a dark line across the spectrum. Our sun is mostly made of hydrogen and helium, some carbon and iron and other elements. Much the same elements we are made of. But that's not surprising, since we are born of the same stars. <laughs> 